Like if you're in the gym and you're trying to lift weights, you get taught a very specific way. People say, don't do this, don't do that. But you get to kind of break some of those rules when you're playing catch with some of these objects. I think every rule is broken. Before the kettlebell was in a mace, I felt like crackly. And ever since using kettlebells and the mace bars, I haven't had a shoulder injury. You can't think about the movement as you're doing it because you'll miss the bell. Looking the way you do, you, you don't have the body of a 53-year-old, yeah. man. What is a 53-year-old supposed to look like? It doesn't look like you're lacking any muscle. And so people see yeah. you and they freak out, but maybe that's how we should all look at 53. Depending on how fast you're getting that movement, you're going to have to drill it. An hour of flipping 25 pounds adds up, but yeah. you're not thinking about it because you're trying to figure out the process. It was weird because my... Uh, I, w I woke up and went to look at my phone this morning. It was like this. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, like, really? It was a long day. I don't remember, I don't remember this. Yeah. There's a picture I've been seeing on his, uh, his like, IG thing or something. I don't know. But it's it's it just saved on your phone now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, like, yeah. I feel so good about that. That's why I had to protect my phone the other day when my wife came to take it. Like, what is this? Finding out yeah, what, I'm, what I'm checking out. How'd all this stuff start for you, Colin? Um, Tossing around these kettlebells like a madman. Wow. Yeah. How did that start? I think um, originally was seeing a old Russian kettlebell. Well, it wasn't even a kettlebell. It was like an old Russian circus. Mm. And it was a circus act. And they had the strong man and he was he had a, a like a big metal sphere that he was yeah. like throwing up and he was catching on the back of his neck and he would shoot it up again and, would, and he'd catch it and then he would give it to the guy in the crowd and it would and be like, damn, that's a heavy ball. So then he went and um, it was like a strength thing. He had a, mm -hmm. a big kettlebell. He would put two of them together and press it. And then he would take damn. the one and flip it. And that was my first introduction to like seeing somebody flip a kettlebell. Mm. And then um, just going down a rabbit hole, I would say, looking to see what else was out there. Um, the Russians, what they call was classic kettlebell juggling, and they were doing flips and things with mm. the uh, the kettlebell. But it was pretty basic, just how many rotations that you can get the handle to spin and catch it in a clean fashion. Um, I like that. And then I was like, let me try it. And I, I could only get it like once or twice. Mm -hmm. Stuff and, like this? Yeah. Yes. That's it right there. So... um. I, I thought that was, you know, I thought that was interesting. Yeah. So I was our like, buddy, let me try uh, it. Our, our strength coach buddy, uh, Corey Schlesinger, uh -huh. uh, was throwing back and forth, I think, with uh, one of his friends. They were throwing back back and forth like a 100-pound mm. kettlebell. And that's yeah. kind of the first time. I, I mean, I, I've seen people flip them before, but I didn't really know that people were practicing it and doing it like in training sessions. Yeah. It um super interesting. You know what it is? It's not, um, I won't say it's, training sessions per se. Mm -hmm. It's really just, um, it's like a fun pastime that in the interim, you are gonna get a workout out of. Mm. But it's more so um, the mental almost aspect. Like a, almost like a game. Yes, a little almost, bit like a game almost like a game and you movement. want, you get to um, kind of figure out a puzzle mm. as you start to move. Oh, I think this is the one right there. Um, you start to move the uh, oh my God. the weight around. You kind of figure out how can I do this even better, or how can I make it? For me, it was always how can I make it a little bit more difficult, um, and that just increased over the years. And I started to create different um, flows, I would say, with the kettlebell. Um, there's another style that's in Asia. It was uh, lock lock juggling. Um, it's like the it was stone block. The stone right? block is uh it's called a lock. The lock was um I don't know how these guys was coming up with these things, but in researching the lock, the lock was basically how they um dammed the water from going into the rice fields. So they would slide the lock back and forth in the dams. So I guess somebody at some point was like, let me work out with these things. And same thing with the kettlebell. The original kettlebell was almost like a balancing weight on how they sold grain at the market. It would mm. counterbalance the weight mm. um for sales. So I guess they was using that. Oh yeah, that's yeah. the guy right there. So, oh my gosh. so cool. the locks and the kettlebells kind of work together. But the the way that the the Asians were juggling the locks was different from how the Russians were juggling. Mm. So they had more flair. They had more flair to it. Yes. Whoa. You know, what's interesting is like if you're to think about this from like a uh, 
like if you're in the gym and you're trying to lift weights, mm-hmm. um, it's kind of hard to do anything comparable. Like I'm trying to think if you were to use a cable, like you get taught a very specific way yes. when you lift weights. And then people say, don't do this, don't do that. Uh, but you get to kind of break some of those rules when you're playing catch with some of these objects. I think um, every rule is broken. And that might be upsetting to a lot of people too. Because they're like, you're not supposed to do that. Like, you know, and it's like, why are you doing that? Oh, you look crazy doing that. And you're just like, people have been doing this for centuries. Right? It's, it looks new to you because it's your first time seeing it because it's not in our makeup of the way that we've been taught about how to train. Mm-hmm. Um, talking about how to train. like all, We're always taught you need the three. Bench, squat, deadlift. So that's been ingrained, even in myself growing up, that's all I knew. And man, I've been training forever and I just kind of got bored with that. And it's like, I'm doing the same thing day in, day out. Okay, I got strong. All right, I'm going to slim down. All right, I'm going to get that big. I was like, what else is there for me to explore? And then um, through traveling and seeing other people, like um, you ever see those shows where the guys like going around the world doing odd things? Um, like Anthony Bourdain? Like, uh, well, uh, that's the foodie guy. I love oh. that. But um, it's not even Anthony Bourdain. It was like an ex-football player, and he would go to another country and – Like um, bend pans and stuff, that like sort of thing? Or like do like feats of like strength or whatever? Man, it's like just participate in different participate stuff. in different sports, yeah. different okay. games, things like that. Uh, gotcha. And it was like there's a whole what we're doing, <clears throat> the big three, is just uh, you know, a drop in the ocean of how people train. So um even like in Scotland, the guy he's got on a kilt, he's flipping a log. And it's like we're not doing that over here, but that's their way of training. Mm-hmm. Um the even Indian back to, people with the uh with the stone, with yeah. the with the and with the, the gala and the and clubs, stuff. yeah, that, that was interesting for me too. And even back to India, they would they would lift like the the stones, mm-hmm. but as they would the way that they did it was, you know, you got to really squat down and shoot up, and and they would jam their elbow into their uh, groin area and catch the stone in one hand, and that's and then put the other hand on top, and that's how they would lift it. Um, what was that called? Just type in like it was Indian like, stone lifting. Indian Something stone lifting, yeah. Um, it's crazy. So it started to intrigue me on how else can I train? How else, what else is interesting? Which put me onto the, like the mace bar. Um, and then circling back to juggling, between the kettlebell juggling and the lock juggling, I kind of just melded the two together mm. and then added my own style Um I used to dance. I have like a little dancing background, mm-hmm. and it felt good to just kind of move the weight around me um, and put it in places where you really can't see it, but I need to feel where it's going to be. And that, um, just that feeling, really captured me to want to just continue doing it, regardless of what anybody else is saying. You still do some normal shit here and there. Oh, you know what's crazy <laughs> is um, cable crossover. I, or um, curl or I haven't like been in a regular gym mm. consistently I want to say in, in about two or three years so I miss the machines because you know that was my 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 Fine, base yeah. yeah um but 95 percent of my training is still the regular stuff man I still I still bench still deadlift I'm still squatting um I'm just not posting it yeah but but 95 percent of my training is that but I also my approach to training has changed so much. I'm always doing something that's free form. Um, I'm always using a kettlebell now too. It feels, it just feels right. Um, before the kettlebells in a mace, I felt like crackly. Yeah, like I would raise my arm and it's like, you know, you my knees. yesterday that like there was a point you couldn't get your Yeah, arm. I had, um, I was consistently dislocating my, uh, my left shoulder. Mm. At least four times. So it was always like dislocation, work back to getting the strength, dislocate it, work back to getting the strength. Um, so I was like, something's not, I'm not doing something right mm-hmm. if that's consistently happening. Um, which led me to uh, the mace because it, it got my arm back in places that I wasn't, that I, it wasn't going because of it's just that range of motion wasn't being hit. Mm-hmm. Um, and ever since using 
kettlebells and the mace bars. I haven't had a shoulder injury. Mm. It's been years. Yeah. What do you, what do you think so uh, great about the mace? Like, what does it? What did it do for you and your shoulder that a lot of that stuff went away? Oh, it was making me use my rotator cuff in a way that I wasn't using it before, and I could actually feel. Um, the difference in some of the muscles that were being, uh, you know, uh, being a t being being awoken that were just dead, mm -hmm. probably that I wasn't even using before, just because of the way it came all the way around my head, um, and it really put my elbow really back and up yeah. as it pulls on. Uh, oh yeah, that's it right yeah, your there. Your arm man. is getting your arms are getting forced in a position. But kind of gently, especially yes. when you're just starting and you're starting with something light and you don't have great range of motion. Right. And then it's working the entire body the way that it's meant to be worked. So if you, when people have a shoulder injury, let's say their right shoulder is really bothering them. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they'll be tight through the stomach and tight through the hips. As they go to push their arm up in the air, they can't do it very well because this whole side right. is shut down. And what you were doing there where you were uh, maneuvering that uh, metal object around the back of your head. Yes. Your el both elbows are going up. And exactly. you're getting a lot a of lot extension. Of it's, yep. um, the mace, what you don't see is that it takes a lot of core balance to move the weight behind you also. Um, and that's what I explain to people too. Like It's not just swinging a bar around. You have to be stable within your body else. The bar is going to pull you in the direction that you don't it's want it to go. very smooth the way you do it. Yeah. Very smooth. Oh, it, it almost no feels, break. it feels um, therapeutic. Mm. It feels like you're getting a massage when you when the weight is going around. It feels really good. But that is um, really, I want to say, what, what put my shoulder back in place. And I haven't had any issues since. Yeah. yeah. So I always tell, um, I always tell people like, try it uh, with a lighter weight, 10 pounds. Because of the way the weight is distributed, it's really away from the bar. The 10 pounds is going to feel a lot heavier than you think it will. Mm. Yeah, don't, you know, for us, as soon as you say, oh, 10 pounds is light, oh, no, that's nothing. Mm -hmm. So they go right to a 20 pound and wants to yank your shoulder right out because <laughs> you need to understand the way the weight is moving. Um, it feels really good. But that is something I always recommend to somebody also. If you have any, like, really bad shoulder pain, like the mace is really good. And I've, I've been training some guys that, um, Man, they have like frozen shoulder. They've been benching mm -hmm. forever. Mm -hmm. And they can't go, you know, they're, they're stuck. And we haven't even been able to get to mace because they can't even get their elbow to go back up because their shoulder's such in that rigid spot. You know, when the guys are benching all the time, they're just they're just stuck like this. Yeah. And that's it's um it's nice to see them progress to be able to get their head, their arm up and back around and move their shoulder in a, in a nice position. Mm -hmm. What's yeah. your suggestion to people? Because like many people in our audience have been powerlifting for a long time. So mm -hmm. they might find that when they get there, they feel kind of uncomfortable. Right. So what's your suggestion for what they should do before getting to the mace? Oh, man. I would say a lot more stretching, even if you get the band and hook it on to a, you know, a pull-up bar. Just mm -hmm. kind of pull into that stretch around. Um, try to relax. Try to relax. Also, what I found is that it, the shoulder is kind of attached to the scapula also. So put put your arm in like the nape of your shoulder in here and then try to pull and stretch through that position also to kind of free that up because this right here is going to be this in a little while. So you want to start low and then start working your way up. And also, even if you just put your elbow on the wall and trying to rotate back and forth mm -hmm. and get that movement again, but a lot of people, um, they stretch, but it's just not getting into that spot where your, your, your um, shoulder's working. It's almost like you need some decompression. And I think that's yeah. a lot of what you're doing when you mm -hmm. throw the kettlebell, even, even without the flip necessarily, if you just throw the kettlebell up yeah. and you catch it, um, it's going to, you were mentioning like how you would uh, like pull your shoulder out yeah. of the socket. Yeah. You know, it's it's kind of doing a version of that, but it's right. like a decompression when you it's, learn how to catch it um, properly. I want to say it's more like a, like a traction. There you go. Yeah. Right um, word for it, yeah. What I noticed too is when I'm teaching somebody how to juggle or flip the bell, they keep their arm like this. Yeah. Right? And I'm saying free your elbow up so that it can really pull into the joint the way it needs to pull. Um, so that the swing, so if I want to get the bell to the outside, I'm going to push to the opposite side because where you start helps your finish. So I'm going to release that elbow and let the weight pull because you want to put the, um, uh, you want to put the weight 
in a place to do the work for you because you don't want to muscle the weight. You just want to guide the weight. So as you push it this way, the gravity is going to take place and it pulls the weight out away from you. There's a little pull and you're controlling the pull through your arm, through your shoulder, and then through your grip and then you just release it. Mm. And that release, just for that short moment of time, um, to re-catch it again, it's, it, it just feels, it feels right, man. It feels really good. That's yeah. one of the things about it. It's like after you get done doing some of it, especially if you've allowed your body to like reach and relax. Yes. You feel like you got to work at it, but you also feel decompressed. Yes. You feel like loose. Your body feels long. Yes. That's why like after I started doing it, um, and you know, I don't know if I mentioned this to you, but there's, I first saw you doing it like mm -hmm. last year, maybe a year, year and yeah. a half ago. I put it on my store. I was like, I want to do this. I never did it. Right. And then Jared came and then he showed me just like, the first flip, and I was right. like, and I started doing it every day. And yeah. after I started doing it, bro, it's like my body just, everything started feeling better and better. Yeah. It's not like I felt like shit, right. but it, it it just loosened everything up even more. And it's like I have more freedom of right. movement now because right. of it. And there's a lot of twists and turns um, to get the bell in the right place that you needed to go. That also happens also. Um, the other part of feeling outside of your body is, is I always say there's a mental piece of man, it's almost like a relaxation mm -hmm. because in the moment of moving the weight also, everything kind of disappears. And it might even just be for a split second, five seconds, but when you're really in tune and you're moving, it's like you don't see anything else in the room. Mm -hmm. You're just kind of in space mm -hmm. um, until you miss the handle and then everything snaps back to reality. And then, then you're looking for where the bell's gonna fall so you don't get hit. But in that moment in time, um, man, it's like there's such a connection to yourself and body that um, I don't know what else could describe it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You but know, you, you, well. you, you really get lost in where the movement is because if you're looking at that right now, I'm already three steps ahead of the movement that I'm that's happening right now because you can't you can't think about the movement as you're doing it because you'll miss the bell. It's already just happening, and you're already three steps ahead of the movement um, as it's happening. If you have knee pain or lower back pain, the initial thought is that it's probably coming from the knee or the lower back. But have you ever thought that it could actually be coming from your feet? Most people wear shoes like this. They are narrow, they are not flat, they are inflexible. So it's almost like your feet are stuck in casts all day long. And if you imagine that your hand was stuck in a cast all day, well, your fingers are gonna become weak, but then your elbows might start feeling a little bit wonky because your fingers don't move and then it might travel up your shoulder. That's the same thing that happens with your feet when you put them in normal inflexible shoes. That's why you wanna throw those out <laughs> and Start using some Vivo barefoot shoes. They have shoes for hiking on their website, working out in the gym. They have casual shoes like these novices right here. But the difference with Vivo is that they have a wide toe box so that your feet, like my wide ass feet, can spread and move within the shoe. They're flat so that your feet are doing the work when you're walking and they are flexible so your feet have the freedom to move the way they need to move so that they can be strong feet. That's why you want to get yourself some of these. And Andrew, how can they get it? Yes, that's over at vivobarefoot.com slash power project. When you guys get there, you'll see a code across the top. Make sure you enter that code at checkout for 15% off your entire order. Again, that's at vivobarefoot.com slash power project. Links in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Guys, look at this. Ooh, look at that I could bend. stick that in my mouth. Do it. Uh, I'm not going to do Come this. Come on. Disgusting. Okay. No. Get him. How do you... Uh I guess, like, encourage other people to do this, like, um, when you are not able to uh, work with them, like, actually in person. Uh, do you just sit, tell somebody, hey, man, you know, pick up kind of a light kettlebell and just see if you can just twirl it around for a minute and just kind of play with it? Nah, the first thing I always say is know your basics. Because um, it's so interesting to watch that you want to just go out and start flipping the bell. Mm -hmm. um, but the first thing you want to do is know the bell itself and how to put it in a clean, um, how to snatch, how to press, um, and how to swing. Because what I see is a lot of people that don't know how to swing a bell, the first thing you want to do is they're, they're muscling their way through the whole process. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where you're going to get hurt because it's not about um, the strength of how you move the bell is awareness of the bell and how you're moving your body. Because everything is still 
generated out of the hip swing. When you look at it though, it just looks like you're pulling it with your arm. And the lighter you go, you fool yourself into doing the work where you take your body, the rest of your body out of the movement. So I always say, before you even get into flips, know your root basics. You gotta know how to swing the bell. You gotta know where the weight is being generated from, which is from the hip swing, the hip drive, the hinge. Um, how to put it in clean, because after you catch it, there's a hand insertion that needs to take place. So if you don't know how to insert your hand into the window of the handle, um, it just looks janky it, and, it, and it doesn't feel right. And you'll see somebody that, you can tell a difference if somebody knows how to use a kettlebell or not, because when they put it in clean, the clean is here, this is the rack position, but they'll throw it back here in the shoulder. And then that is not, you know, how to use a kettlebell. So I always mm -hmm. say start with the basics first. Just even to learn how to swing because the swing, even the swing itself, um, there's a sport style of kettlebell swing and there's a hard style. The hard style swing won't mesh well with the juggle. It has to be a sport, smooth swing through the hinge um, that makes the bell actually vertically elevate um, instead of shooting away from you. Because mm -hmm. you want the bell relatively close within that arm's distance, slightly bent, so that as it's turning, you have time to catch the bell and decelerate. Um, so there's a, you know, acceleration with the inertia that you put through your hip to put it in space. Um, and then there's the deceleration that you want to catch and decelerate the bell back through your hip again. So yeah, that's where you would start, learning the basics. And then once you learn the basics of a a sport style snatch because you want the weight to be kind of vertical and take time to get up, then you can start just releasing the handle and catching it. That's that's where I would start. Just mm -hmm. simply take your hand off the handle, watch where the weight, where the where the handle is, because you want it to be released flat. Um, and once you're comfortable with that, and also comfortable with just letting the bell go, you want to release it, don't catch it, and see where the bell is falling. So you, you can start to track, how am I gonna get out of the way when the ball when the bell falls? Cause I've I've um I remember teaching somebody and the bell fell and um he just didn't move. He just watched it. And it just rolled back to him. And I'm like, why didn't you get out of the way? Like what are you doing? <laughs> and um couldn't like predict that it was gonna swing right, back and yeah. then hit him. Right. Yeah. And that that oh, that that is the uh the sport. Oh I like this guy. He's good. He's up in Canada. Yeah, it looks to me like there's no uh, like jerking motions. It's right. Uh, it's really smooth right yeah. through the hip, yeah. and then yeah. see how oh, exactly what he's doing. You want to get the bell into a place where the hip is driving and the bell is floating straight up. Right? Andrew, I'm not sure if yeah. you're going to be able to find this, but see if you can bring up. Um, I think it's Barbell Shrugged um, or Atlas Shrugged. Mm -hmm. uh, he. Uh, showed a uh, a movement the other day and he was referencing like how uh this guy just said like this movement doesn't work because mm -hmm. of the way that your back is positioned oh, squat university right so is that what it was doesn't work i think it was yeah maybe maybe it was a zercher or maybe it was um shit what's that other one where you uh jefferson, jefferson curl. curl that's what it was mm -hmm. uh, it was bad. a jefferson curl uh -huh. and uh the person uh, demonstrating, like, they couldn't really open up their spine. Mm -hmm. They couldn't really round their spine. And so he was basically kind of describing uh, the oh, fact shrug. that uh, the guy wasn't able to even execute the exercise the right way. And he's uh -huh. like, that's why this exercise is, like, not working well because he's not able to really execute it the right, <laughs> right way. So I think it's kind of important to show along with what we're talking about because mm -hmm. uh, if we can find I'll it. find but, it. Okay. Yeah, he'll find it at some point. But have you found that your back, you know, like doing squat, bench, deadlift. Yeah or the squats and deadlifts, mm -hmm. our body, you know, you, you're you trying to get your body to be rigid. Yes. And to stay in one position. Yes. And if you think about it, the spine, even though like we're, we call it a hip hinge, mm -hmm. but the spine doesn't really move at all. There's not much movement going no. on in a deadlift no. or a squat. At least there, there kind of really shouldn't be most of the time if right. you're trying to work with maximal loads and right. trying to get the most amount of weight. Um, but in a lot of what you do and a lot of what I see other people starting to do and starting to catch on to mm -hmm. is like, I want more movement in my spine. And if you start to do so with less mm -hmm. weight and it's not 400 pounds, right. 
a 70 pound kettle or a 70 kilo kettlebell or something like that could be, or I'm sorry, 40 pound, 40 kilo kettlebell could mm -hmm. be heavy. Uh, but in comparison to the 400 pounds someone has loaded right. on their back, it's a totally different it's movement. A total, it's a total different movement in a way that um, with the compound movement, you're locking everything up and putting stress on everything at the same time and then moving. Um, with the kettlebell, everything isn't being locked at the same time. There's there's different fluidity through your body as the weight is being transferred mm -hmm. as you go up. And then at the top, there's a lock. Um, I find that more pleasing on the body than a straight, uh, I'm just, yeah, you know, and, and holding my breath to the point of where I want to pass out getting dizzy. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing little bubbles. Um, I like the fluidity of, of the uh, a kettlebell, even with like a heavier weight, because... Um, there's there's an explosion of power that needs to take place. And you're still getting that through the hip. And there is some fixation of the lower back, but it's driving through the earth. Um, similar to like a, like a punch. The punch isn't mm -hmm. starting up top. It's starting through the ground and through all the way up to your body. So you, you want look to like a boxer. That. Have you boxed before? <laughs> very, very Looks like he's got a reach yeah. over there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like he's going to fucking like, knock me out all the way over there. <laughs> Very briefly, but I grew up like, um, you know, just fighting in the street, man, from Brooklyn, New York. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's like um, you learn how to street box, you know, but that's part of just growing up in New York, I would say. Unless, unless mm -hmm. you, my brother would always say, man, there's two people, man. You're either a weasel or a weasel slapper. And you got to be, what, <laughs> what are you going to be? So I'm like, I'm going to be the weasel slapper. So, um, yeah, that, that feeling of knowing that you got to generate the power through your body is the same thing that you're going to get through the swing. You know that it's coming from the ground up and then snatching the weight up. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we found the video, but one thing mm -hmm. too that like you'll see when people watch you do it and Jared and mm -hmm. it is like over time you get better at like in a squat. Everything has to be locked in. Every part of the body has to be doing one thing. Yeah. But when you start doing stuff with the kettlebell, you learn how to dis disassociate certain parts of the body from yes. other parts of the body. So, like, this can be loose while certain parts of your body are kind of keeping everything yeah. in place. Um, just watching you do that, um, you'll see in a swing, like, the right hand will be doing the work and the left hand is almost like a whip. Mm -hmm. mm. Right? So, you're, that hand is also helping even though it's not it's not actually engaged in the swing there's there's parts that that are tight and there's parts that's going to be loose so when you're swinging a heavy bell that other hand is the counterbalance to that weight and you're whipping that hand back it's and a lot it, like it, sport right yeah you yeah. know if you're gonna do a spin or something like that you drive the elbow back so right. your body will kind of whip around yes you're throwing a ball i don't think we think about you know we only think about being right-handed mm -hmm. but we've if you are right-handed, you forget about what the left is doing as yeah. you're going to throw, and yeah. sometimes even with a punch. Same right? thing. It's like if, yeah. if you load, if you load the left with a jab, and you throw a straight right mm -hmm. afterwards, you kind of loaded the hips. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty neat. Like, yeah. Let's uh, see if we can play this mm -hmm. clip. Beer of the Jefferson Curl. Except that the guy in the video isn't doing it remotely right. Here, I'm going to throw up a video so you can compare. Patrick had back pain for a long time that multiple physical therapists and doctors couldn't fix. Some suggested strength. So what it looks like is happening here is that Patrick's just rushing through the movement. He rounds his upper spine a little bit, but then just dumps into a hip hinge and makes no attempt to around the middle portion or lower portion of his spine. And that part stays mostly straight. Mm. It's possible that he really is that limited, but you don't really even see him try. And given that he doesn't even have a platform to give him clearance to get a full stretch at the bottom it just looks like he hasn't been properly coached in this movement now you might think that squat you would fix that and tell him how to actually do the movement right but instead he looked up some study about a dead pig <laughs> the romanian deadlift looks barely any different i mean the range of motion is almost exactly the same here in conclusion squat you post spine <laughs> so here we have a big that's funny it's just interesting, you know. Those yeah. are conventional ways of lifting that we've mm -hmm. uh, all heard of and all been taught. Right, keep this like rigid spine, and and maybe those are maybe yeah. that is a great practice when you're trying a heavy one rep, lift the most right. amount of weight possible, or even like a three rep max. Uh, but maybe we should look into moving in some other ways, especially yeah. with lighter weights. I was always taught growing up too, man. If I'm dead left and put a belt on, mm. um, and as I progressed and learned more. Somebody was like, yo, take the belt off. Like, fix your stomach, man. Your stomach is naturally your belt. Mm. And 
I took the belt off and man, it was a total different experience. And I was just like, I was really needing a belt, needing a belt, but it was, it was just because I was taught that. Mm. Uh, and then now I don't even, I don't even use a belt unless I'm going like over 500 pounds. And I don't even, I don't even remember the last time I lifted that much just cause my mindset isn't there to mm -hmm. go that heavy anymore. Uh, I just like feeling good. I don't want to be washed up the next day because I'm always so active, and I don't want a long recovery time. Like so, so that's like maybe four hundred, yeah, yeah, four or yeah. five, and and man, I won't use a belt now until I'm about at five hundred pounds, and that's just you know safety first. Now this podcast probably has you super interested in starting some kettlebell flipping or juggling. And before you pull the trigger on a competition kettlebell, because I've tried a few, I want to tell you to go and get your hands on Aleco bells. Now hearing the word Aleco, they make extremely high quality overall equipment, but their competition bells are literally a dream to flip and juggle. I've used a few others when I started and these are by far just... Mm. The butteriest to put in your hands. They go all the way from 8 kilos to 32 kilograms, but I would suggest starting yourself off with an 8 or a 12 kilogram bell and then work your way up. The link is in the description if you want to get your hands on these bells. Enjoy the podcast. But my yeah. guy, to be like 53 years old, yeah. moving this smooth, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And looking the way you do. Thank you don't you. have the body of a 53-year-old, yeah. man. But <laughs> it's um, insane. Man, I, I, and I hear that and I'm just like, what is a 53-year-old supposed to look like? Like I think that just just in our society we've we've um we've accepted the fact that you get old and you get sick, mm -hmm. and that is not how it's supposed to be, man. You just age well and take care of yourself and still move, um, and you just you live you live you know longevity. But but to have the mindset that I'm hitting fifty. I'm supposed to be on diabetic pills, <laughs> heart pills, and it's okay. That's not that's not a good a good mindset. So I hear it, and I just and I have friends that are you know they they on they're diabetic, um, they're on some sort of heart pill. They they and it goes back to diet too. Like they they're eating trash, and because the mindset is this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm at this age. It's expected. Yeah. And I'm like, no, no, you don't have to live like that. Have you you've been taking care of your physical health for yes since the beginning, huh? Um, man, it was it. I think it just it wasn't planned. Just through life, just eating right and um, being conscious, and also being in the gym and 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 figuring out what I need to eat. I was I was big on like uh, man. Big on like, oh, you need to, you know, protein, this and that. Mm -hmm. And then and then um just from experimenting on my own body, I would cycle off of certain things. Um, like for me, I had stopped eating um pork first. And that was just from having some Muslim friends that were like, Oh, we don't eat pork. So I was like, You don't eat bacon? Like what's <laughs> bacon and bacon, so egg good. and cheese? I'm like, Are you crazy? Um, I remember my favorite thing was like a bacon and tomato on toast, and I would just eat that all the time. And um my friend was like, yeah, don't eat pork. And I was just like, all right, I'm going to stop eating pork. And then that was like my first experiment of not eating a certain type of um, food or meat. These guys don't understand a bacon, egg, and cheese on a hard roll. Oh, they don't oh, have it out here yeah. for some reason. It's You're weird. Right. No? no? Nope. <laughs> I've never had it. Have you? No, never no I've never been to the East Coast. Cheese. Oh, there we go. Yeah. It's so good. Damn. What's a hard roll? I know. See? It's, it's, yeah. It doesn't sound it's, pleasant. I know. Oh, I man. Know. You, all right. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. When you go home, mm -hmm. make yourself a bacon, egg, and cheese. All right. I will. All right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, and that's weird because. I don't eat bacon, and I'm, and I'm telling you, like, <laughs> do it for him. Yeah, just just I'll have a bacon, yo, we'll ba a bacon. bacon, egg, and cheese, even on a bagel, man. But yeah. the bagels are different in New York. Um, it's it's hard to describe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, you, I hate when I leave New York. I don't buy bagels. <laughs> yeah, because you look at them, you're like, the hell is this? <laughs> yeah. So a bacon, egg, and cheese on a nice roll. Um, yeah, do that for yourself. Oh, yeah, I you would. gotta have one. Right. Um, so, back to not eating. You got eating, rid of right? some of the protein and all yeah. that. Yeah, for a little bit. Man, my protein, my protein intake right now is super low. Um, 
for for a lot of people, it's odd because uh, I haven't had red meat in my, maybe thirty years. Damn, um, See, that's a hard rolling seam. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's there right there. <laughs> <laughs> my bad. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that is good. like the New York breakfast right there. Language of love, right yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> For 30 years, no 30, red meat. 30, 30 years, no red meat. So um, when people ask me about my diet, it's kind of hard for me to say this is what I do because it's just, it's not calculated in the American diet. You know, everybody wants a steak, everybody wants a protein. Mm -hmm. And that is just what we've been taught where your protein source is, is through meat. Um, that being said, my diet is mostly uh, grains and nuts, fruits. I do eat fish now. I do have some chicken now, but that is um, far and few between. Yeah. Why'd my, you bring the chicken and fish back? Oh, it's just because my daughter was getting older. She wanted to. Uh, she wanted us to have chicken, and <laughs> I was just like, "All right, let's let's start having some chicken." Yeah. Yeah. So we start cooking chicken in the house just for mm -hmm. her to eat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did you uh, do this based off of like? Um, previous like health concern or was it more like experimentation to see it was a lot more i want to say through experimentation just to see what i was uh what i needed what i mm -hmm. felt like um fasting was a, was another thing that was interesting for me um i would cycle on and off of of different things to see how i felt like i would do pre workout and starting to feel like it was, I think it was one day where I didn't have any pre-workout. So I worked out and I just felt weak and sluggish. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, damn, I'm addicted to this stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't, I, cause mentally I kept saying, I need the pre-workout, I need the pre-workout. And then um, that's what made me say, you know what? Let's not do the pre-workout. Let's cycle off of it for a month, see how you feel. And the first, the first couple of weeks I was terrible. I felt weak, non-motivated. And then it kind of just got out of my system and I was back in, back in tune. And that was interesting for me just for self-experimentation. And I went maybe two months without it and then went back on it and felt strong and, and, and powerful. <laughs> I was like, damn, this shit works. Um, but then that feeling of wanting it again made me say, let me cycle back off. And I was doing that for maybe a year, one month on, one month off. Um, and then I started doing that with the protein to see how I felt one month on, one month off. And then eventually I just cycled off of everything and I've just been natural and I've just been feeling good. Any it, idea where your protein levels are approximately? You think it's like half your body weight in grams of protein I, or something? I'm way less. Yeah. I want to say daily, maybe 50 grams, mm. 60 grams of protein. Yeah. Yeah. So what on a good what, day? Yeah. What does a day of eating look like for you then? Man, day of eating for Colin. Yeah. I I wake up. Um. I put the pot on the stove. I make oatmeal. I use steel cut oatmeal. Um. And then I meditate. So while I'm meditating, the oatmeal is cooking. Um. When that's done, I I get a banana, cranberries walnuts or pumpkin seeds, and that's my breakfast. Mm -hmm. uh, I would work out, and I won't eat again until maybe two, and that would be a green drink or I like like an acai bowl. Acai is good. Yeah. yeah. Right? And then, so then that's more fruit. Um, maybe about six or seven, I would do, I like uh, wild rice, brown rice, plantains, I'm... West Indian, so oh, plantain, yeah, right? I love plantains. Right, right. plantains, yeah, yeah. Um, avocado, and uh, spinach. Like I cooked spinach, and some black beans, and then um, that's about it. And I would drink water and tea throughout the day. I'm like I'm big on tea, so I would drink a lot of tea. Lately, I've been drinking coffee, um, and that's and I have like um, cashews, walnuts, seeds that I snack on throughout the day, and that's that's. That is my meal 90% of the time. That's what I'm eating all day. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't look like you're lacking any muscle. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> so you got plenty of that yeah. going on. Yeah. So, um, man, I get the protein out of the the leafy greens and the seeds and the nuts and beans. And, yeah, that's that's it. And then in some days I'm, I'm, I don't know if it's intermittent fasting or just fasting in general where I'm not, I feel, if I don't feel like I need to eat, then I won't eat. And then it's gotten to the point where I'm telling myself to eat just on the base of, 
you didn't eat all day. You you should mm-hmm. eat something because you're on, you know, your stomach's empty. Mm-hmm. Um, so I spend more time telling myself to eat than than not to eat. Yeah. Now, now Colin, you've been eating this way for a while. Yeah. I, there's there's two parts to this. The first thing I want to know is there was there ever a time that you felt like you were food dependent, meaning that you felt like you had to eat a lot of food? When- Absolutely. There was a time where Man, I wanted to get big, you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. man. I was walking around, no lie. I was in the military at the time. And I would go to the mess hall, and I would just put potatoes in my cargo pants. And I would, like, <laughs> <laughs> I would walk around with food in my pocket, um, tuna fish sandwiches, you know, a bowl of uh, mixed vegetables, and I would just be eating all day yeah. long. And... I was like, my mindset was, I'm going to get big. I'm going to get strong. And I would eat all day. Even when I was already full, I'm still stuffing a potato down my face. And it was just constant eating, 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 eating. And then I could not put on the amount of weight that I wanted to, no matter how heavy I lifted. Um, yeah, it just wasn't happening, man. But I was struggling. And it was, it was, I was always eating i was definitely food dependent Mm -hmm. and it was all mental at the time because um i was and i was looking good everybody was like yo you look amazing you should be like on stage somewhere but me looking at myself was like Mm -hmm. i'm not big enough Ah, dysmorphia yeah yeah Yeah. i don't i don't i'm not strong enough you know so i was always just eating man and yeah i was definitely at one point um food dependent yeah what so what have, what habit do you think helped you with that? Was it like picking up a bit of fasting? Because I know for me, it was a little bit of fasting mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. helped me realize I don't need to eat all the time to yeah. perform well. I think it was the, it was the opposite. It mm-hmm. was me just saying, coming to reality that I can't get that big. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because it was either that or some steroids. And it was like, I'm definitely not going down that road. Yeah. So I just kind of, um, man, I remember reading this book. It was uh it was about a like a, a LA gangbanger or something like that. It was Monster Cody. And Monster Cody was was in jail. He was he was big and he was like, I'm gonna slim down to a warrior body. And that just resonated with me. And I was just like, You're not a big guy, you're not gonna make it. Get a warrior body. And then that's kind of was the trigger for me to say, let me switch up what I'm doing, how I'm approaching this. And then um I stopped trying to eat as much because it was a lot of work. It was a lot of work. That's a, man, that's a lot of work trying to put on weight the right way. Yeah. The autom- oh, wow. Oh, yeah, that's it right there. That book, that book, <laughs> Monster Cody, the L.A. gangbanger. He, um, my man was like, I'm going to slim down and get a warrior body. And that, that resonated with me. I was yeah. like, I don't have a big body, man. I need to just go warrior status. And then that's. What do you weigh now? 175. And what were you at your heaviest? 210. Damn. Yeah. Okay. TRT. It's a popular topic. A lot of guys are hopping on it. It's something that we've talked about a lot. And you might think you're a candidate, but how would you know if you haven't got your blood work done and you don't know where your markers are? That's why we've partnered with Merrick Health, owned by Derek for More Plates, More Dates. And the cool thing about Merrick is you'll get your blood work done, and you'll also have a patient care coordinator that can help you analyze your blood work, analyze your testosterone, and all these other markers to help you actually figure out if you're someone who needs TRT, because there could be things that you could be doing nutritionally with supplements or even with your lifestyle that can boost your testosterone to the levels that they should actually be at. Andrew, how can they get their hands on it? Yes, that's over at MerrickHealth.com slash Power Project. And at checkout, enter promo code Power Project to save 10% off the Power Project panel, the checkup panel, or any individual lab that you select. Again, that's at MerrickHealth.com slash Power Project. Promo code Power Project at checkout. Links in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Yeah, I think uh, in our society today here in the United States, Mm -hmm. people have gotten to be so heavy that I think we don't have a good idea of what a warrior body looks like. Yeah. And so people see yeah. you and they freak out. You know, I can't believe you're 53. Right. But maybe that's how we should all look at 53. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I agree. Hard to it, hard to work for and hard to do, but I mean I don't even think, think back like hundreds of years ago. A lot of activity. Oh, that tire, we call that the donut. Yeah. <laughs> I mean at this point yeah. you probably don't really look at your workouts so much as even though 
some of them are done in the gym. You probably don't really even look at them as workouts. It's just like movement, right? Yes. Movement well, practice. I have a thing also. Um, I change my workouts based on the season. So in the summer, That's cool. I go outside way more. As soon as the summer hits, I'm in the backyard. I'm in the parks. Mm -hmm. um, I like to be fresh air, sunlight, um, ride my bike. Mm -hmm. And as it cools off, I'm back in the gym. I'm lifting a little heavier and I'm moving a little slower. It gets cold. In yeah. The oh, man. <laughs> so, and and that's what I, uh, one thing I would say I admire about the Russians. They're outside all the time. And it's snowing and they're, they're flipping kettlebells. I'm like, so I'm like, I'm going to try that. It's not happening, man. I tried it. I tried it, and my hands were frozen. Yeah. And I remember DMing one of the not guys. All freezing yeah, I'm face. like, how do you do this? Mm -hmm. And he's just like, this is what we do. And I'm just like, I respect that. I'm a summer guy. I will. I will take my kettlebell to Jamaica and go to the beach. And yeah, yeah. So, man, being outside and changing the workouts for the season really helps me too. Yeah, mm -hmm. based on the season. You know, something that I think is. Um, also kind of really dope about what you do is because we've, we've talked a lot about how uh, maybe some people don't play as many sports as they get older. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't do some of these activities where they're forced to jump or yeah. or even forced to use their eyes for certain things. It all ends up being in the gym. Right. But the things that you're building on the background as you're doing a lot of the kettlebell stuff is like now you're, you're having to calculate first off where your hand needs to be to catch this object. Yes. So you're catching. And then your eyes are learning how to track this bell because I noticed that as I was getting better, I'm like, Oh, I can see it spinning, versus yeah. like initially, like I don't know where the fuck's gonna be. Right. Then it's like, oh, I, I see, I see. Right. It's, it's like so your eyes start learning how to track this. Yes. And you're getting all these aspects of training, and even when you're catching behind your back and you can't see it, you feel it. You feel it. Yeah, yeah. Right? I, I tell people it's more so. It increases your awareness. Some. Um, you ever you ever been like sleeping and you wake up and. And somebody's watching you, mm -hmm. and what? you know that, and, and that's why you wake up. You're like, wait, wait till you, yeah, yeah, wait till you have kids in SEMA. Then you just wake up like, <laughs> see a what are you stuff. doing? <laughs> They're this close to you, I, I, um, and they don't say anything; just stare. Yeah, they're just looking at you. It's kind of like uh, I think, all right, coming from <laughs> New York, terrible. coming from New York, taking a train, you uh, you kind of doze off sometimes, but you're not all the way asleep. So that awareness is still there and you kind of feel the energies around you. Mm -hmm. That's the type of feeling that you get when you're juggling. Mm -hmm. Like, um, especially when the bell is behind your back, you don't see it, but based on the release, the feeling of how much inertia you created in a bell, you're gonna know exactly where that bell is gonna be. So you don't need to see, you just put your hand out and it's right there. And that's the connection I think is invaluable with the the kettlebell juggling. There's it, it heightens your awareness. Um, what do you call it when the when the, the brain is firing the synapses? Mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't sounds know. Sounds right good name. to me. Yeah. Sounds good, right? <laughs> we'll go the yeah. brain synapses. The brain synapses. <laughs> <laughs> it, serious. It, yeah. <laughs> it um it it just increases that level of awareness for me. That feels right. Also, that you're not gonna get from just being on a bench, bench pressing until like maybe the bar roll out of your hand or something like that. But it's, um, it leaves your mind more awake in the movement. Uh, it just feels, it, it's that feel good feeling that you, you, you won't get it until you do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you gotten stronger from some of this stuff? So like you're mentioning, it sounds like you can kind of pick up like a 500 mm -hmm. pound deadlift yeah. almost any time um, without doing those exercises maybe mm -hmm. as much i understand you did mention that yeah. you still do them yeah but without doing them as much and kind of uh relinquishing like the desire to like go real heavy mm -hmm. and instead replace it with a lot of the other stuff that you're doing mm -hmm. have you noticed when you go back to those things and sort of like oh, let me just try this 500 pounds does it feel yeah. easier almost it doesn't feel easier but it's, it's still the power still there the mm -hmm. explosive power the initial um Pull. So you might have to work it and refine it for a couple of weeks if right. you really wanted to like yeah, if pull I really 525. Wanted, exactly. If I really wanted to go back to lifting something heavy, I could probably get there in a month. I, I know the process. And that's also just from years of training. Mm -hmm. You know what you need to do to get to a certain amount of weight. Um, but it keeps me... Um, keeps you at a high capacity it keeps me all the yeah, time engaged it keeps me fired up all the time where um okay i can't snatch 100 pounds today give me three days and, and i'll snatch it you know so 
it keeps you um, fine tuned. I would say, man, it keeps you yeah. tuned up. Yeah. And you did say that uh, you don't like the aftermath of yeah. that heavy lift, yeah. and that's something that's yeah. not really talked about that much. You huh. know, we talk a lot about jujitsu and training, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're only you're only as good as uh, your ability to recover mm -hmm. from right. a training session. Mm -hmm. right. That's cool that you ran ten miles, but yeah. now you're messed up for five days. <laughs> like, it, if that's some sort of event and it's yeah. some sort of rite of passage for you, mm -hmm. then that's probably cool. But right. Otherwise, you need to be a little careful with some of those things. Yeah, at, at 53, um, I'm not trying to smash myself anymore. Like, um, you know, I, I know what my body's capable of doing. I've, I've done it many times, and I'm just in a, in a comfort place mentally where I can say, oh, I don't want to do that. You know, I want, I want to do this and not feel, um, feel like a sucker for not wanting to do it. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, I think there's... Um, I guess it goes back to like ego, man. I, I'm able to park my ego, mm -hmm. and sometimes ego is good because it's it's protecting you. Um, so it makes you it makes you want to go a little harder sometimes. And and when I'm in that zone, I respect it, and I'll go hard. Um, but it's not an everyday need to redline myself. Uh, yeah. yeah. And also, there there seems to be progression because. Mo you know, when I was younger, the mm -hmm. progression was based off of how much can I add, like how much stronger am I getting each month? Yes. I wouldn't add weight on the bar every session, but I knew that the what I'm the volume I'm doing right now is going to let me deadlift 700 That's here. That's why we would yeah. write it down, right? Yeah, right. Write it right. down. We saw what we right. did last time. We're uh -huh. add weight. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but with what you do, like with the different ways that you're learning how to move maces, the different mm -hmm. things you're, the different patterns you create with kettlebells. Right. These are different progressions. Like the progressions are the different ways in which you learn how to move. Yes. Um, say for instance for us, we um we had three moves we needed to do. We were practicing. And what we did was we broke them apart and then drilled them. So depending on how fast you're getting that movement, you're gonna have to drill it. So maybe it, it'll take an hour. Just for your body to remember the pattern and an hour of flipping twenty five pounds adds up, right? But yeah. you're not thinking about it because you're trying to figure out the process. So that one gets locked in, you add the second part. And once you figure out the second movement, you connect them together. So then you go from one progression to the other progression. And the part about the flow is how do you connect the two so it looks seamless? And that would be the transition point from left to right, right? And then you add in the third move. So there's three different moves uh, two different connection points. And the, the key is to make it look seamless. And those are your levels of progression. And once everything is connected and you run through the uh, the pattern movement, and the, the key is to repeat that pattern on a loop as many times as possible mm. without breaking. So there is a presence that needs to happen to say, this is what's next. This is what's next. My timing has to be right. And you have to keep that connection of where you're moving the weight, how to catch the weight, how much speed you need to be, and relax while you're doing it so that you don't get so tight because you can't move, you can't flow. So that's the progression that I would say eventually turns the kettlebell juggling into a workout session. Have you noticed anything in particular improving? Uh conditioning like if you went out on a run or maybe you hit some pads uh boxing mm -hmm. or maybe you hit a heavy bag and you're like holy crap like i feel stronger have you noticed yeah. any changes like that over the years in doing some of these methods yeah i have much more endurance um breath my breath is right uh my mental space of i know i can go a little bit longer is there that's definitely a proven improvement in my breathing and my endurance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also my awareness. So it's, I'm just really aware of what's happening around me too. Right? Yeah. A lot of stuff, exercise in the gym, they don't usually involve much at all in terms of like reflexes. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, and what and you're doing has got some reflexes. Reflexes and the cardio aspect of it. it, it I've always feel like I'm, I was on a treadmill after juggling for a while because mm -hmm. your cardio, your heart rate is up and it, it also allows you to cool down faster um, as you're moving too, because you're just gonna going from left to right, right to left. It's not a uh, a movement pattern that you do in the gym a lot, also, because we're always just going forward or backwards, mm -hmm. right? So being able to move left to right really um, opened up a different 
aspect of the way I move my body also. Are there some things that you're seeing sometimes uh, other people do with kettlebells or uh, maybe these other heavy objects that they're throwing around mm -hmm. where you're, you haven't been able to maybe execute it quite yet? Is there anybody out there where you're like, damn, I, I want to be able to figure out, out that uh, new movement pattern? Man. Or you've been able to kind of mimic most yeah, of them? Yeah, I can, I can um, watch somebody's movement um, and kind of figure it out to do it. What I notice is is my left my left side has to have I call it sending the signal. I have to I struggle a little bit more on my left side on certain catches than I do on my right side. So my right side I catch it fast, and my left side I have to really work at it. Same. It, yeah, <laughs> so I don't know if it's because I'm a righty or whatever, just the way that my thought pattern is. Um, that would be like the only struggle. Then in in doing this, I know that the repetition is what's going to help you get the trick. Mm. Um, so I won't say there's, there's, I have seen some things that I'm like, damn, how did he, how did he come up with that move? Mm. Yeah. Cause because um, the beauty in the juggle also is when people start to juggle and it start to, starts to make sense to them, it takes on their own persona, their own style. And you can look at them and say, that is, say, Sean Pierce up in Canada. You know that's Sean's style. Um, with Jared, uh, Crazy Trainer, you know that's Crazy Trainer style. Mm -hmm. um, there's a guy, Gavin, Twisted Cheat Meal. You know that's going to be, you know that's his style. Um, when you look at them, okay, all right, let me, let me retract. Gavin, Twisted Cheat Meal, has a classic style Russian juggling style. Um, that he, he, you know, he flips the bell four or five rotations um, before he catches it. Oh, yeah. And that's going to take me a long time to do. So I don't, it's, there's certain points. There, so there is, so there are people that are doing things that I can say I cannot do. And yet, yet, but it goes back to, do I want to do that? And you can admire it. And you can also say, yeah. well, that's not even really me. Like, oh, I'm, that's my I'm, man right there. You can say, I'm fine with uh, doing things my own style. Yes. Right. But but this is his style. Yeah. Also, watch his knees. Like, when he creates all that torsion, watch Yeah, you'll his see his knee. leg comments. He looks totally disinterested. <laughs> 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 For some reason, he's just, like, hurling this thing. Watch around. Yeah. Wow. So you're making oh, he's space. jump. Yeah. yeah, you make space for the bell to travel. Damn. Um, there's a... Wow. Man, I can't remember his name. There's one guy like uh, out Sean. of Russia, and that's Sean. Damn. Yeah. See how smooth that. See that. See that smooth. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, that's what I said. Yo. <laughs> yeah. Man. Right. So cool to be able to absorb that force. You yes. Know? Like I know that uh, some of these kettlebells uh, look a little bigger, and they're not always crazy heavy in terms of the weight. Uh huh. But it's still a lot of weight. And then to be able to do it unbroken right. and to really wow. absorb that force the way that you guys do is really an incredible thing. And that's all about putting the bell in the right place at the mm -hmm. right time. So you got to know how much force you're, you're creating to, oh, that's, that's And you nice. watch these guys mm -hmm. catch the weight. Like, see how the knees bounce every time? Like yeah. The knees go down right. as he's catching them or the arm goes down or a shoulder will pop down a bit. Right. And you also notice like the hip movement in terms of, whoop, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like the momentum, it's like a pendulum. There's that. And then like the shoulders, like like right there going behind the back. Yeah. Like you can't be stiff and do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you, and, as, and as soon as you catch it, as soon as it hits your hand, you're going to mm -hmm. move and, and, and uh, decelerate the weight. You're going you're gonna to mm -hmm. absorb that inertia and then let it flow out. So you're really just guiding the weight as oh. to where you want it. Um, there's a guy like uh, out of Russia. It starts with a P, pro, pro, pro something. Mm. Man, I always, I, whenever I see his post, I'm like, man, he's top five because he's doing everything that we're doing with like 70 pounds. Wow. Whoa. Damn, I wish we could find his Yeah, P R P P P R O D something. Him? I follow him. Yeah. P R O D on his yeah, something like that. This guy is so strong, man. And, Detective and, Andrew, let's <laughs> and smooth, and that's what I mean by as you as you learn the process, mm -hmm. you you can add more weight when you want it to be more challenging. So there are days where I'm trying to flip, you know, fifty pounds, sixty pounds. 
it's not going to be the same exact flip. Um, but just the fact of creating that explosiveness um, to be able to turn the handle on the bell and then decelerate it again feels really good too. I think we need like a uh, kettle flip, uh, uh, like challenges, you know, like you get one person in the middle, yeah, and they do their thing, yeah, and exp- uh, we, <laughs> it's um, like a I, battle, yeah, 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 yeah. break dancing we, or something. We do that, uh, we do that often too on a Sunday. We call it the after party, where it's uh, everybody's just kind of doing their thing, and there's a learning process in that also because you're you're able to see, um, what the person is doing that they're not seeing, and then you say, you know what, if you did it this way. You, you will be able to catch it because mm. they're not thinking about it that way. They're thinking about it in their own way. But because you're outside watching them, um, you can tell them, hey, yo, try it this way. It's kind of like um, kids at the skateboard park and, and mm-hmm. they're trying these different tricks and flips and they're emulating each other. And then they're just coming up with new movements. Mm. Yeah. Have you ever done a competition before? They have competitions for this stuff? They only have classical competitions. There's mm-hmm. Well... What I'm doing, what a lot of new guys are doing, isn't isn't considered classic kettlebell juggling. It's, um, it doesn't really have a name yet. It's kind of like just this new age thing um, because uh, it, we don't follow the same patterns of the Russian classical style. Mm. Um, it's more the bell is closer to you and you're moving it left, right, forward, center. Um, so it's, we, there hasn't been a juggling competition based on our style. Mm. I would, and definitely a yet, cause we always talk about, we need to get together and have some sort of format, but I think everything is still really fresh mm. and new. It's that, like an art form. So it's hard to like really grade, yeah, right? Like right. one guy goes versus the other. Exactly. Like, it'd be um, like figure skating, you know, yeah. where they, you're like, I'm <laughs> yeah. not sure why the other person right. got better points. <laughs> right. It's subjective right. for sure. Right. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the a lot of it is um we don't really have all of the names yet. Mm. So it's kinda like we gotta have some sort of coming together where we could say this is this name for this move because it's kinda all subjective to what you think it mm. should be. Um What's crazy in figure skating is they ha- they have a routine. Yes. And the routine's on like a piece of paper. Mm-hmm. Right. And so the judges can see did you hit that triple whatever it's called, yes. right? And so imagine trying to do that with what you're doing. You have to remember what you wrote down and right. your routine. And then someone's got to, oh, he he was trying to go for three flips and he only did two. Yes. You know, so you get a deduction. Yes. yes. <laughs> and and that's kind of how we do it right yeah. now. We were mm-hmm. saying, um, like yesterday, we we said one two up top, one in the back, yeah. back to two, um, rotation. That's your switch, figure eight, into snatch, rack flip. So we know the movement and the pattern that needs to happen. Um, but to get everybody on the same page is universal. Um, this is the move. I think there's, there's, I had a conversation with somebody. Um, God, that's so good for your brain and your memory. Yes. It's yeah, like a football player, those, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Remember it's those like three, four things yeah. the guy just said, and you got um, to try to do he, it. And I remember the person was telling me, um, his name was Alex. He was saying, uh, yo, you need ownership because as, I don't know if the, the popularity of kettlebell juggling is, mm-hmm. is, is starting to pick up and people are doing it. Like people are doing the moves that I've created, but not knowing that I've created that move. Mm. They need to give you 50 cents every time they, <laughs> every time they hit so, that move up. So it's hey. like there's no, there's no ownership in what you're doing. Mm. And because somebody else is doing it. Uh, Which video has a lot of wolf flips? Because we, I want, I want wow. it to, I want it to be right here flips. known that like this man created mm-hmm. the wolf flip. Man. Which video should we click? The the out of the top three pinned. Top three. Because I would say. I mean, we could watch all of them if you guys want. Yeah, click on all of them. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's the wolf. That's, that, that, wow. Yeah. So I was like, I, I made that <laughs> flip up just out of just experimentation. That is definitely a wolf flip. Yeah, yeah, that's it right there. Um, <laughs> and I started naming it. Started saying, "Yo, this is the wolf flip because yeah. no one, no one else in recorded history has ever done it." So I was like, "That's my signature flip," uh-huh. and it's been able to to stick, mm-hmm. right? Um, but also the flip behind the back and catching it in the same hand was yeah. something that I that I created. So 
that's long gone. So I don't even have a name for that, but it's just a behind the back catch. But that is, I would have to say, is my signature flip, um, which is the wolf flip. And that flip right there also. If there's and, a competition for this, it will get nuts because as somebody flips something, they'll like break off on their hand and yeah. like, you know, oh, do something man. in between and then catch it. There's so <laughs> much. Uh, I went to like a, a kettlebell event in Atlanta and a lot of like, Man, maybe the forefathers, I would say, of, of juggling were there. And it oh. just felt, it was just, it was just uh, crazy to see everybody in the same building, you know? Because there was this one guy, I always give him credit, man, um, Drew Miller, uh, I, just out of Canada. And he was, he was a kettlebell guy, but when I started doing kettlebells, he had already been, you know, uh, in kettlebells. Um and that was somebody I was looking forward to, like look, asking questions about how to clean correctly, mm -hmm. snatch things like that, and how do you uh, how do you juggle the bell? He did this one move. Um, he was the first person I seen do it where he would he flipped the bell under his leg, and he caught it on the other side, and that was that was the game changer for me. That was like that was me saying, this is something I want to do. And I guess it's the same thing when somebody would see me be like, oh, you know what? This is what I want to do. He was that person for me, so I always give him credit for that. Um, I think you were that person for this guy. Yeah, yeah. Man. yeah. So right. he doesn't he doesn't juggle as much, but he still was was there. And it was my first time meeting him, and I and I had been following him for man years, yo. And it was just nice to be in the same space um, with a lot of people that have the same interests, because it, for a long time it was I only knew of like three or four people that were doing this, mm -hmm. and that was outside of Russia. And that was just on seeing them on social media um, and just talking in DMs like, well, what do you think about this? How are you doing that? What's your approach to this move? Mm -hmm. um, and then just becoming insulated and doing it myself and just really practicing and, and just uh, developing the skill. Most of your followers are probably used to it. But yeah, it's in, like it's jaded Sema. right now. A lot of my followers are like, ah, that's, that's just kind of doing this thing, you know? <laughs> I realize it. Yeah. I think when Encima posts it, though, it might have a different reaction. Yeah, yeah. It's, what do you, do you know think, what it is? Uh, about people like, um, I don't know, just having a lot of negative comments about it? Mm. Uh, I would just say they're uh, uneducated about it. Mm -hmm. um, and that goes to, in the fitness industry, people are driven by results. You don't, they don't understand what the result is. So the approach to it is, it's, it's, um, you know, you kind of hate on what you don't know, you know, and once you get the information about what's happening or, or how it feels, um, and you, I would just, I always, when, when I get the negative comments, uh, just kind of read them, um, and just keep it pushing really, man. I don't get involved in responding or, or unless, but okay, I've noticed that somebody saying, why are you even doing that? Is them actually generally wanting to know why are you doing that? But the wording is bad. Mm -hmm. It sounds like they're hating, but they're actually saying, no, seriously, I really want to know what you're doing and what are the benefits to it. Yeah. It's just um, text and there's not much context. Yes, it, yeah. it's like, like it's, it's, um, it was, uh, I wanted to say it was somebody from Spain and he was saying, this looks dumb, why are you doing it? <laughs> and I'm like, who are you talking to? You know what I mean? <laughs> but, but he later DM'd me and it was generally like, I really want to know how to start doing this. And I'm like, man, your message read so crazy. <laughs> I'm like... I probably would have slapped you if I, if you were here. <laughs> yeah, in person uh, yeah, for sure, yeah. yeah. And, and that's the part where you kind of got to um, take it with a grain of salt and just keep it pushing. But f I, now it's it's so many followers that I don't, um, I won't say I don't, but I really, really don't try to feed into the comments. Like if I feel like if you're serious about something at this point, you'll shoot a direct message. Mm. But if you're just commenting, you're just kind of just, uh, couch surfing, mm -hmm. talking, talking trash. But yeah, but where else can I go to learn more about this? Do you have a YouTube channel? Like a, a legitimate question, right? Yeah, exactly. Rather than, like, Rather than, than, than <laughs> oh, why are you doing that? This is dumb. <laughs> what? Um, the most interesting comment 
I think, uh, was somebody saying, I wanted to fall and hit you. Why do they why do they want to put curses on people? So I, I responded to that one because it was interesting. I was like, Am I reading this correctly? You want to see me get hurt. And and his response was, Yes, a thousand percent. And I was like, Wow, you really want to watch me injure myself. You're like, okay, what happened to you when you were nine? Yeah, <laughs> like exactly. Like tell, tell and me I, your and, story. Um, <laughs> I was just like, yo, man, I send you health and, and, and best wishes, yo, because that's a sad thing to say. Mm -hmm. But he meant it. He was like, I want to see you get hurt. And it was just, um, that comes from a place of like jealousy, man. And I, and I knew that. Um, so I don't take those, 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 those comments on, but I always, but I always, um, always encourage people to just try it. Yeah. You might, you, you, you might be. You might be hating on it now, but you really might like it. And that's that has been the outcome for a lot of people that once they try it, they're kind of like, you know what? I kind of like this. And, and they just kind of start getting into it. Yeah. Right now, I know you're looking in the mirror. You're getting ready for your nephew's quinceanera. You have a long sleeve on that looks horrible and your pants don't fit right. <laughs> that's why we partnered. I don't know why you're laughing. That's why we partnered with Viore Clothing. You see, this is the Boulevard shirt jacket. Fits great, stretchy. Feels amazing. It's the best long sleeve in my closet. And one of the biggest things that we love about Viore is that they have clothes that you can wear to parties. They have clothes that you can wear in the gym. Like I said, your nephew's quinceanera. <laughs> you can look great wherever you go if you step your fashion game up. Plus, this stuff feels like baby skin on your skin, which is kind of <laughs> creepy, but at the same time, it's kind of nice and you know it. Andrew, where can they get it? <laughs> yes, yeah, so you guys got to head over to viori.com slash power project. That's V-U-O-R-I dot com slash power project to automatically receive 20% off your order. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. I think also like... Because first, I've, I've gotten so many of those comments at this point, too. People like, just wait until he stops posting. That's when you know he's fucked his toe up or some <laughs> shit, right? It's just like, I don't know why these people want this to happen. But, yeah. you, you know, if you're interested in trying it, people are always talking about the toes and dropping yeah. the bell on the toes. Yeah. It's like, go out to a park, right? right? Grass. Because if you drop the bell on grass, it's a dead stop. Yes. It's not going to be bouncy. But mm -hmm. then you can, like you just you mentioned earlier yeah. in the podcast... You can mess with dropping it and see what dropping it from here is like, and dropping it right. from here is like before you even start. Exactly. My 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 thing is, um, in case of talking about injuries, I've hurt myself more doing a deadlift than I than I did uh, juggling kettlebells. Same. Right. And I'm like, why is me hurting myself doing a deadlift acceptable? Mm but me doing something that I like to do that looks different from what you're used to doing, not acceptable. There's, there's danger in everything that we do. So don't go into it thinking, oh, it's gonna drop on your foot. Okay, I could blow my back out on a, on a deadlift. Same thing, why is that acceptable and this is not? And that's, that's the question that sometimes I ask them too. Like, is it okay if I drop a, 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 a dumbbell on my foot? Is that okay? Because what's the difference? And if your mindset is, I'm going to go into this and hurt myself. You'll, you'll never go platinum. You'll just be <laughs> wood in the hood, man. You, you, you won't make it. Yeah. Have you always been, you seem uh, seem pretty calm. As yeah. like, uh, when you were younger, were you... Uh, definitely maybe, not. Maybe not. <laughs> yeah, were you maybe not as calm? I mean, I you, was definitely not calm when I was younger, man. Like you're real precise with your yeah. words. And I uh -huh. noticed you're not doing a lot of ands and ums. And you mm -hmm. actually stop and breathe and then... Yeah, you know, you you're you're not afraid to have like a little pause, right? In between the wording, and sometimes people are nervous and they're not able to do that. Wow, I didn't think about that. You must be confident in yourself, is what I'm thinking. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've been doing. I, I always say, uh, I definitely know what I'm doing when it comes to juggling, kettlebell and stuff like that. I've been doing it for a long time. Seven when years, I was right? younger, so, oh yeah, a couple of years. Well. Wow. Uh, I want to say I started about 2014, 15, like juggling and things like that. Younger, I was definitely not calm. It, just to answer that question, I was always, man, ready to fight, always mad. Uh, and that just comes from growing up in the city. You got you to be not on edge, but on point because you never know. So you got to be ready at all times. And over the years... Meditation has really gave me that point to take a breath and be calm 
before I, before I speak and really maybe try to put words into place that need to be there. Yeah. Meditation is key. Uh, meditation would not have probably landed on you when you were young, right? Like someone say, hey, even man, you just start, need to take yeah, a breath. Yeah, like, even, <laughs> even starting to meditate was really hard to just be silent and still because I'm always so active and, and moving around. But I think it's needed as a balance. Just like we say physical health is important. I didn't realize that mental health is just as important as, as we grow older also. So I think... Uh, if we go down that road of just physical, always apply a little bit of mental health with it also. Yeah. What does applying the practice of meditation, what does that look like for you like in practice? In practice, 15 to 20 minutes every morning mm -hmm. before I start my day, before I pick up my phone, before I turn on the TV, which I hardly do anymore. Mm -hmm. I wake up, you know, give thanks, new day, 10 toes down on the floor, and I put the pot on and I sit down and I meditate, just stillness. Yeah. Get my, I always say put my mental armor on. Mm, gotcha. yeah. mm -hmm. What you got over there, Andrew? I think that was uh, Feral Munch, right? That said, I sold platinum around the world. You sold wood in the hood. Yes, that yeah. was Feral Munch. Yeah. Right <laughs> and, like, um, that clicked for me right you, away. You, you never go platinum is uh, Snoop. He's like, uh, that's Harold Melvin without the blue notes. Ah, okay. Yeah, you never go platinum. <laughs> <laughs> what I was going to ask is if somebody... Um, because a lot of us, we got into the gym because we wanted to change our bodies. We wanted to become something, you know, we wanted to look like the dudes in the magazine yeah. and stuff. And so the first thing we we turn to is like bodybuilding. Yes. So if somebody is interested in trying to improve their physique, there's, I know there's tons of examples of, mm -hmm. of people, you know, juggling these days now, but how many more examples are there of like bodybuilders, right? Because like that's kind of like the standard thing. So yes. for somebody that does want to improve their physique, what advice do you have for them? And, and you know, because you say you like to encourage people to try. Mm -hmm. So how do you My, encourage somebody to try when they're, when they have that on their mind? I would say, man, start with one push up is what I always tell people. You don't even have to go to the gym. Just start with one push up for the day. The next day you do two. Next day you'll do three. And you start to get the mental space of, I'm gonna carve some time out for myself. Cause a lot of people, the first thing they say is I don't have time. I don't have time. Oh, I ain't got time to go to the gym. Wake up and start building the mental strength to say, I'm gonna carve out some time. How much time does it take to do one push up? No time at all. But the mentality is saying, I don't even wanna do one push up. So you have to start by carving out space for yourself mentally um, and physically. That's why the mental and the physical space comes in. Because there are times where I don't have time. I don't have 15 minutes to meditate, but I make sure I meditate anyway. And it all works out, always. Yeah, even if it's five minutes. Mm -hmm. But that space that you make uh, for yourself is building the discipline for you to start getting into physical shape. So start with one push-up. Yeah. You meditated your way here. Yeah, right. The oh, plane man. got diverted. And everything. Exactly. I was out. The plane got diverted, and I was I was like spiraling down like a rabbit hole of how am I going to get there on time? How am I going to get there on time? Like looking at other flights, and I was like, you know what? Relax. Take a break. Go sit down. There's nothing you could do. Um, there's no one to punch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if and, there was, the maybe is, we could handle it that way. But you, there's you no one get, to punch. You get so caught up in worrying about things that you can't even control. Mm -hmm. And then that just ruins your day. Mm -hmm. So if you know you can't control it, why even stress and go crazy about it? Just, I like what just, you said yeah. about it earlier. You, were, you said there were other people on the flight too. Yeah. Their like, plans got changed. Right. Like It was so many people that um, were going to miss a flight. You know, I heard somebody next to me like, oh, I got to get a hotel because my, my there's no other flight until tomorrow. Um, and I was just like, I'm not in that boat, you know, I know I can get there. Mm. Um, so I was like, let me just relax, yo, cut it out. Like, what are you doing? Calm down. And a guy's health was compromised, right? Yeah, so you yeah, gotta be yeah. thoughtful of that too. You're like, well, right. you know. It's a bigger picture. Right. Yeah, yeah. So in regards to uh, and to, to the juggling, I'm sure at this point, mm -hmm. it's probably harder to flip it less, but is there a way to juggle without I'll, I guess I'll say like the the flair of it all because for me personally like when I see you guys flipping and stuff I do worry like oh shit I'm gonna I'm gonna miss it something's gonna happen but maybe if I just swing it and then like uh 
one of the examples of somebody we, mm. we pulled up, he was just showing like letting go and then catching it. Yes. Is that, can somebody start there? Like, absolutely. Or, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now you got me listening to when I say, um, <laughs> yeah, that's how it goes. I, um, I wasn't paying attention to that. Now I'm like, am I saying arm um, now? Uh, <laughs> start with the swing. Start right, with the right, swing right, and right. the snatch, and then start to just let the handle go and catch it. That would be my suggestion mm -hmm. if you want to start to flip the bell. The way that the handle turns are two different ways. You can push the handle away, or you can from the top or the bottom, that's going to turn the direction of the, the handle either forward or reverse. A lot of people, when I start to teach it, they're, they're flipping the handle away from them with their finger and a hook, kind of hooking and pulling where you actually need to use your thumb. Mm. You turn your hand the other way and push the handle that way. Mm -hmm. But if you want the bell to turn this way, you actually push away with your palm at the bottom and then just leave your palm in place. What happens is people chase the handle, right? So the handle's moving away from them and they're, they're following the handle <laughs> all the way around to catch it and then they won't catch it. And that's the part that I think people need education on is how to create the inertia of the speed of the handle and where to put your hand as far as catching it again. And Because we're, we're like, uh, most people from a sports background, if the ball's coming at you, you're going to turn your palm down. And that's the way that a lot of people they'll push and then bring mm -hmm. their palm down and the handle's coming around and hit them on the knuckle and they just, just can't figure out what's happening. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of rethinking of where your hand placement needs to be and sending the signal to deliberately put your hand in a place so that the handle rotates into it. You want to put the handle where it needs to be and don't chase the handle to catch the handle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Jared actually uh, shared something too yesterday. He mentioned something he has people do is he has them do a swing and they'll let go of the handle, but just to tap it and catch it. Yes. Mm -hmm. So they can just tap it in midair, catch, yeah. swing, tap, 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 catch. Mm -hmm. So it's like these little things just to get familiar with touching the bell while right. it's falling. And then right. just and not it. being not being so scared of the fact that you're letting go. Because there's a the, the letting go aspect. Um, let me see. Oh, I'm again. The letting go aspect is a fear for a lot of people also because they're just used to have to hold on really tight and grip the handle. So, and, and that's just in kettlebells in general, there's not, you don't need a real solid tight grip because you have to be able to move your hand in and out of the window for a window insertion to put the bell in position. And if you're dead gripping the bell all the way up into the snatch, as it gets to the top, it just reels over because you can't hold the weight as far and it just smacks you in your, on your wrist. And that's a big turnoff for people. And, and it goes back to understanding. That's something that actually helped me a lot. Um, learning how to like, it was when I went to Austin, Jared just told me like, just relax my hands a bit. Mm -hmm. Right. Because like I was, there were times where I was more relaxed and times that I was still gripping the bell a little bit too hard. Yeah. It's just like, keep the hand, the hands are like, just keep the hand relaxed the whole yeah. time around the, the handle. Right. Right. And just kind of loosen up because that allows you to be loose. Yes. And then your, your fingers are just like hooks. Exactly. Right? Your hand won't get as fatigued. Right. Because you're not fucking death gripping the bell. <laughs> yeah. It's and, a big difference. Uh, and that was, um, I think for my initial introduction into kettlebell, that was what I was doing too. It was like death gripping the bell because, you know, I'm coming out of, death grip in the, the, the barbell uh, and it makes you rethink the way that you use your hands, the way you use your body. And that's why I always say, start with the basics first, know how to just put it in a clean snatch deadlift, and then you can start moving the weight in a different fashion. I noticed for myself, just picking up a kettlebell and just looking at it like a timer. I'll put the timer on my phone and just, it'll just be on a couple minutes and I'll I, I went one minute one day, another minute I went two minutes and three minutes. And uh, just the goal for me is just to keep moving with it. Yes. You know, and I'll try different exercises and different movements. I don't have the flips down yet, but I'm working on a bunch of different stuff, doing some lunges and some different movements. I don't have a lot of kettlebell experience. So I'm mm -hmm. like, well, let me just get familiar with this piece. Yes. Let me get familiar with this thing. And then uh, from there, over time, I can progress it. Right. I, the swing, even for a minute, two minutes, if you're doing it right, that's a good workout. Mm. Yeah. And then snatching for a minute. Um, 
sport, kettlebell sport is swing clean, press or jerk. That over a minute will tax you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that is another aspect to kettlebells that is the root of everything besides juggling. Even so, I would I would definitely start with the basics, learn the different styles, hard style, sports style before you do anything and then start to explore. Yeah. How like how long do you flip for sometimes cuz like some of these clips that we see on Instagram hours. Looks like you're going for a while and is there much break hours. in between like not really. Set it down and yeah, yeah, sometimes yeah. um sometimes you have to put it down and take a step and kind of really think how much pressure am I putting on catching the belt, especially like over the shoulder and kind of um make your adjustments and then try it again. But man, you can really go for hours and not even realize that you're going for hours. Would it be uh, common for you to go five, 10 minutes like in a row without setting it down at all? Absolutely. 30 minutes. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot minutes. of work. Yeah. This one looks great. brutal. And is in great shape, but I see him just dripping with sweat mm-hmm. when he's uh, working with those kettlebells in there. We were yesterday, we were working on something and we spent maybe I think four hours. Yes. Him, Jared, and I, like yeah. we were working on something. We spent four hours in the gym wow. trying to figure this thing out. At least I was really trying to figure it out. <laughs> they they most they mostly had it down, right? right? And that that went back to us separating the movements. So it it probably took like an hour to get this one move down where it was comfortable. <laughs> and then um another hour for the second move. And then it was like another hour and just trying to put the two moves together. And then by that time, it was just about the transitions on how to get the bell between the first and the second move. Mm-hmm. And the, the elation of putting all three moves together, it was like, uh, man, climbing Mount Everest. Because it, mm-hmm. it takes, it's not, the other turn off to it, is you're gonna fail more than you succeed. And I think that may be a lot really frustrating for a lot of people. But if you enjoy the process of failing, trying again, trying again, because you t- you 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 spend more time chasing the bell to pick it back up <laughs> <laughs> to start over than you actually get to do the flip. We were saying that it took us four hours for a minute's worth of work. And that's the part that people don't see. You don't, you're not just gonna go out there and start juggling and be amazing. It takes a lot of work to get to that level of proficiency. Mm. Yeah. It's like playing football, like with your son. Like when you're, if you have a kid and they're little, you're going to run around way more than they are. Yes. <laughs> they can't catch it. They can't do shit. They take forever. Yes. You're like, God yes. damn. You're out there just sweating right. bullets. Right. And you're frustrated like, catch the ball, God damn it. Open your glove. Yeah. <laughs> Open your glove. <laughs> and the ball rolls down the hill. Yeah. And you got to go down. Yeah. You're yeah. like, no, you got to go pick it up. <laughs> Yeah, I, do. yeah. I, I love the the like the game of game of I aspect of it all because it I know it's been like a whole I don't know 10 minutes since we've talked about jujitsu but <laughs> but in jujitsu mm-hmm. one session you're dripping in sweat the the like I don't know like the amount of like uh step mill you'd have to do would be like insane for one like morning session right mm-hmm. but you're playing the whole time you're play fighting but you're playing and you don't really under like you don't really even acknowledge the fact that you're doing a lot of cardio so with this and, and there's there's a lot of parallels with the like the sucking in the beginning and the like the frustrating part of it all that does parallel jiu-jitsu and i'm i'm seeing why you're falling in love with it so fast and I it's was, something that i definitely want to start exploring as well yeah i i noticed that i get a lot of jiu-jitsu practitioners that come to me wanting to learn how to juggle <laughs> from all over the world it makes um, sense it, it makes a lot and, of sense and, and I wasn't making a connection until maybe like the four, third or fourth guy came and he was saying that um, the juggling helps his quick reflexes with his hands um, and it's a puzzle for him to figure out. The same way that if he's trying to to put somebody in a hold, he may be holding them, but he's already thinking of three moves, how to get him mm-hmm. to where he wants that person to be to put the lock on him. Mm -hmm. And he said the same feeling of juggling is parallels the same feeling of 
trying to figure out how to get this person in a position to put him in a lock. And I was just like, now I understand why yeah. people like it. And yeah. then there's also the aspect of like, when you're saying like, when you throw something behind your back, based off how you threw it, you know where it's going to land. Yes. There's a lot of that, right? In jujitsu where you're just feeling his body motion. And you're just like, okay, he's probably going to go this way. Sweet. Exactly. Like, yeah. oh, he's coming. Okay, now I'm going to go. You know, like, right. so there's a lot of that stuff where it's like, you can't see it. You have to feel it. Yes. And I, th man, this is cool. <laughs> you know, one of the coolest things from, from doing this is like when you're doing a move and you keep falling and failing and failing, and then you're just like, all right, let me just walk away for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> you just walk away for like a minute yeah. or two. Right. You come back and it's like, it took a little bit to download. Mm -hmm. You come back to it and it's like, oh, there it, it is. Hits. Right. Yeah. And it's just like, it's literally like being right there when your body downloads a movement and then you do it after failing for 30 minutes. Yes. It's the sickest fucking feeling. And ever. I'm always like, take a breath. Cause you can see the person mm -hmm. starting to get tighter yeah. and tighter and tighter and tighter until it just like, uh, uh, uh. and I'm like, look, let's regroup. Think about what we're doing. Mm -hmm. We're just having fun. Right. There's, there's, there's not a, a win or fail in that process. You're just learning to enjoy the movement, learning to connect your body to your, your mind, to your body, mental connection. So let's take a breath. Get all of that angst out of your system and then let's try it again. And then it, it, it sinks, it starts to hit. I think that uh, it's hard to recognize sometimes that you, in order to learn something and do it the right way, mm -hmm. you have to do it the wrong way for a while. Yes. Kind of reminds me of like using your phone GPS for like walking. <laughs> You're trying to walk to a certain place like the fastest or even sometimes just yeah. in your car getting out of the parking lot. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you determine which way to go? It <laughs> right. doesn't really know where you are <laughs> right. yet. Until you so move, you, and then the yeah, arrow goes. go, go the wrong way, and yeah. it tells you to make a U-turn. Right. <laughs> tells it. you to go the other way. Yeah. And it's, it's, um, it's always fun watching, so, watching the click happen. When you see the person, it just hits. It's like there's, it's, they'll be failing 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and then it just... And you're like, damn, I saw it. And they see it. And they're like, oh, shit, I'm <laughs> doing it right now. And they're just moving. And it's, and you're just in that ride with them because you see it happen, uh, taking place right in front of you. And that just that's one of the other feelings that's always good to watch somebody grow in the sport. Like I've, um, I saw a post the other day of somebody that had come from, from London and was learning with me and went back. Um, and then I haven't seen seen them post in a while. And then they post and I'm like, oh shit. Damn, that was good. And I'm like, yo, it's so good to see that progression from when they first start to where they are now. It's just, it's uh it's really it's amazing to see, man. It's amazing to watch. Yeah. It's cool to uh watch somebody work through their own process too of uh sometimes being negative. Yes. And you're like, well, yeah, like, <laughs> calm, 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 yeah, take calm it easy. down. No, it's, it's all right. We're it's, just having fun. It's yeah. brand new. Yeah, yeah. I always, I always want to remind them too that um, the object is to enjoy yourself, to enjoy the exploration, um, the thought pattern, and to be open to being able to fail and just regroup because that's another part of uh, mental tenacity also to just be able to say, all right, I don't, I don't know it now, but I know I'm going to get it. Mm. Yeah. Let me ask this. Cause like a lot of people are the bells to try to use, right? Because there's, there's the cast iron bells, right. there's competition bells. We've been uh, using the Laco sport bells here, right. but what would you suggest based off all the bells you've juggled that like, what are the differences? Well, the cast iron bell, um, the cast iron bell only flips good when it's a really heavy weight. So cast iron is the the the, the, the cast kettlebell. iron bell is the standard kettlebell you'll see yeah. on a on a shelf at Target or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, the weight distribution and the bells are different. So mm -hmm. different brand companies that make competition bells, which is okay. Let's let's back up a second. Cast iron bells are cast iron, right? The big bubble looking bells are called competition bells and those bells are steel. Um, the way that the cast iron bell is designed mostly is there's weight in the handle, there's weight in the body of the bell also. They, they tend to not flip correctly 
because of the weight distribution. Also, there's not enough window space for your hand to catch the bell. The design of the bell itself doesn't really lend to juggling. You're, I find that you're able to flip the cast iron bell at about 24 kilos, which is like 50, 50 pounds or so. That's when it tends, the, the, the distribution is correct. It feels right. But you're only going to be able to turn that bell forward or backwards. That's not something that you want to flip behind your back. Mm. All right. Uh, the steel bell, the competition bell, has a really generous window space, window, window handle. There it is. Now, this bell in particular versus some other bells, there's no uh, weight in the handle. So the body of the bell is what rotates and it makes the handle turn smooth. So there are some bells that there are weight, there is weight in the handle. The bell turns, but depends on where the steel is kind of set. Mm -hmm. It may turn the handle to make it wobble a little bit as it goes through the air. And that with time and practice, a specific bell, you kind of get to know the way that that handle is going to turn. That's why you'll see a lot of people say, this is my juggle bell, because they figured out the weight distribution. Mm. in that in that piece of equipment in that tool it just shows your proficiency though because yesterday as we were working right we had two me and jared had two aleco yes. bells and then i had the other kettlebell kings bell yes. right and the aleco bells they're a bit more they're a bit more smooth right. and then you're like ah, I'll, I'll take the kettlebell kings yeah. right so you were using this for a bit then you had to recalibrate the yes. way you were juggling and it, and it took me a while to mm. um because of the way the bell spins, the, the distribution, you have to recalibrate how your how much inertia you need to put on the bell to spin it. So it takes you. Uh, you'll you'll notice as if you get into juggling, try different brands of bells, and you'll see the difference in the bell. They all have a different feel, mm -hmm. a different texture in the handle. Uh, the weight distribution is off slightly. The design of the bells change depending on the brand company, because no, and even within the the same company, with the same exact weight, the bell's gonna the bell may turn differently also. Mm. So once you get a bell and you start to juggle with it, that becomes your baby because you know the feel of where the handle, the weight distribution, and that that just becomes your juggle bell. Because there's there's one bell that I have. There are different bells at the same weight, and I won't I won't touch the other bells. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, this is the one for me. Yeah. So people get defensive, or say if they're in the gym, like, nah, don't touch that bell. That's, <laughs> that's that's my bell. Don't don't put any bad juju on it. You know, <laughs> don't don't even touch it. That's my juggle bell. Yeah. And I notice that a lot with people, that, and that's why um even even I take my bell sometimes when I travel just to pass time. I'll take this one specific bell, so it, the bell would get you know stamps from traveling. Yeah, it needs a passport. Yeah. Yeah. Also, the cast iron one, people might want to be careful because those can break a lot mm. easier, right? I have broken a cast iron bell. I used to go to like this, uh, like this off area, and it was a, a train and track, it, and it can't be fixed. Like no, it's, it's done. No, it's done. It's yeah. a wrap. Once it once it breaks, it's over. And I dropped the bell, and it bounced and hit the railroad track and just shattered in half. And that Shit. was, and I was just like, I didn't know that could happen. <laughs> Yeah, that was interesting. And then uh, somebody commented the other day was um, I was flipping a really heavy bell and they were like, uh, man, I would drop that and break it. And that hadn't crossed my mind in so long of breaking a kettlebell because I had switched from the cast iron to the steel bell. And the steel bell could take a good smacking around mm -hmm. and not, not break up. Yeah. yeah. There's something I quickly want to bring it back to because mm -hmm. I think it was like really important. You know, you were mentioning a few years before you discovered the mace and the bells, like you had pain in your shoulders, you yeah. had different pain, and now none of that pain exists. Right. And it's a lot of it is because you've started allowing your body to move in these different ways. Yes. So it, I think it's really awesome that, like, yeah, everybody ages. And even if you have something, you don't have to be in pain forever if you can allow yourself to explore different areas of yes. movement and strength. Yes. I think um, what's, what's uh, good for me also is that the kettlebells kind of reignited my love for fitness. Mm. Um, I was getting stagnant of just doing the big three 
over and over and over, adding weight, lightening weight. And then I just kind of was getting bored with doing the same thing over and over. Uh, so when I got introduced, I started using the mace out of an injury from a deadlift where I had, had really like sprained something, you know, no belt going super heavy. Mm -hmm. And I was doing um, a single leg RDL with the, with the bar and it just really pulled something bad. It made me say, let me start exploring other things besides this. Is there something else? And I saw uh, some magazine and the guy had a mace and I was like, what is that? And I ordered one and just started getting into it. And I think the mace brought me back to what the kettlebell. And in teaching the mace, I found it was, it was harder to teach somebody how to use a mace than it was to teach them how to use a kettlebell. So I was like, let me start learning more about the kettlebell um, just for a training aspect of let me start teaching this. And then I started doing bars and bells. Yeah. Where can people find if they want to follow along with your juggling? Oh, Daring 101 on Instagram. D-A-R-I-N-G 101. It's kind of like a first introduction to a college class. It's always like that 101. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was it. Daring 101 IG. And I'm subscribed to your Instagram, yeah. like your, oh, are you, your membership are you, are you, thing. Are you, are you, um, how, how do you like that? It's cool because like, yeah. you, you know, you, you're showing demos of those moves to your subscribers. And yes. it's like, I can like, okay, I see how to do that. Then I can practice right. it. It's dope. You, yeah. it's a, you, do, you do a good job I, with that. Thank man. you. Um, I started that just from people asking a lot of questions. How do you do this? How do you do that? And I was spending so many time responding and making separate videos. I'm just like, you know what? I'm just do a subscription, see if this works. And the feedback has been really good. Even from people that I respect as jugglers have subscribed and they're saying there were certain moves that I just couldn't catch that you have explained and now I'm doing it. Yeah. So I feel like it's an honor to see somebody that I respect as a, a, a juggler subscribing and learning and saying that I've learned something from you. So mm -hmm. I, I, I feel um, I feel like the subscription base is really good. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for your time today. Appreciate it. My pleasure. I'm humbled and honored to be here. Honestly, I, I always feel like um, if somebody wants to take their time out to speak to you, that's man a high honor, y'all. I'm I'm uh, really grateful. Yeah. Strength is never a weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you guys later. All Bye. Right. If you enjoyed this episode with Colin Daring, one of the OGs and veterans, check out this episode with Jared Cardona, who's also into flipping kettlebells, juggling, a lot of other things as far as fitness is concerned. This guy's a jack of all trades, and you will learn a lot from his episode. Uh, we also talk about missionary sex. Mm. It mm -hmm. was mm, That's right. quite vanilla. <laughs>